Welcome back to your favorite podcast, Deke to Deke. In this episode, I had a chance to sit down with Dr. Peter Brubaker. Dr. Brubaker is the faculty athletic representative at Wake Forest University. He and I discussed the different ways that Wake Forest ensures that our student athletes have a, have a world-class academic and athletic experience, some of the emerging issues coming out of the NCAA, and much, much more. Take a listen. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, go Deeks. And cool. So, uh, Dr. Brubaker, uh, I want typically, you know, we go back to the origins and share their story. But your role, uh, I would like to call the most known but yet unknown role because it has such an impact on the game kind of explain, if you don't mind, starting off with Deacon Nation, sort of explain your role as uh, being a part, being the, if I'm not mistaken, the faculty advisor, uh, to, and kind of explain what that is. Sure. Well, th thanks for the question. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here, Kevin. Uh, but, and thanks for that. Thanks for that great question. Um, I've been at Wake Forest as a professor for 30 years. And it wasn't until, until a handful of years ago, five years ago, that President Hatch asked me to take on this, this role. And when, uh, he, when he asked me, I really didn't know what it was. I really had to ask around and ask some other people on campus, what is this thing? Because I never <laughs> knew what it was. I had no idea what I was signing on for. Um, so, and it's taken me years to sort of figure that out. But it's, it's a, every NCAA university institution uh, has to have a faculty athletic representative that is part of the, the NCAA bylaws. It's a requirement. And it is the responsibility of the president of each institution to appoint a faculty athletic representative. And each president goes about it differently and how they might do that and, and such. But the opportunity came, came my way um, five, five years ago. And uh, of course, when the president calls you into his office and makes an offer and request you to do something, of course you say yes before you, <laughs> you know, before yeah. you uh, even ask what, what is it or what am I getting out of it or any of those things. So I said yes, um, somewhat blindly, but, um, you know, then began the process of understanding what the role is. And, 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 and there are definitely um, implications and responsibilities within the NCAA in terms of what the FAR, and I'll call it FAR, Faculty Athletic Rep, what this individual does related to the NCAA such as voting on, on legislative proposals. So anytime there's an NCAA uh, legislative proposal that comes along, it's, it's typically the, the faculty rep that uh, represents the university and casts the vote. Now, of course, that's not done in isolation. I get the perspective of the president and the athletic director and other folks uh, before I would cast uh, you know, a vote for, for our institution. But that, that is really the major role within the NCAA. Then this individual also has a role within the, within the ACC conference. And so I spent a lot of time, not only with my colleagues at the ACC, faculty reps of other ACC schools, but also with the ACC staff and engaging the commissioner and all the associate commissioners on a variety of things. Uh, and um, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a role and responsibility there within the Atlantic Coast Conference. And then third, and I, I think most important is really what we do on our own campuses. And on, on campus, I, I think we can sort of divide the responsibility of the FAR into three buckets. Uh, one would be academic integrity and oversight, right? So first and foremost, I, I'm the one that's supposed to keep an eye on the ship and make sure that the athletic academic uh, you know, balance is, is in place and that it's a healthy balance and the ship's not tilted too far to one, one side or the other. And uh, of course, that's a pleasure and something I feel really good about Wake Forest University. I think we have our, our priorities in place and have a equal respect uh, for both the academic and, and the athletic uh, activities of our student athletes. So that's, you know, sort of role, role number one. Role number two uh, is um, related to this governance that I was talking about with the ACC and with the NCAA. And then third piece and the biggest and, you know, sort of uh, hardest, I think, to tackle is, is, is oversight for student-athlete well-being. I mean, that's a big, broad topic, right? But 
it is my part of my role and responsibility to make sure that you know our student athletes are being well treated and that they're thriving here and that I'm a resource for them if things aren't going well for them uh, and so I, I spent a, a good bit of my, my time and effort really trying to get to know student athletes get to hear what they're going through whether it's their academic struggles or athletic issues and really let them know remind them over and over that I'm a resource for them I'm a, I'm a place that they can go should they have some some concerns or problems that maybe they're not comfortable going to someone in, in the athletic department about, right? Because maybe it's about a coach or a tutor or something in there. And so I try to remind them I'm that safe space. I'm that person they can go to. And I can make sure that whatever this issue is, that, that I can, if it's something of significance, I can go right to the AD or right to the president uh, with these concerns. So those are the three, I think, sort of major buckets uh, that the FAR does on their own campus. Well, Dr. Brubaker, that's a that's a lot. That's a huge <laughs> responsibility because that balance you mentioned, uh, particularly the first bucket when you talked about the academic and athletic uh, experience and involvement keeps that balance. And that really has been at the core of what Wake Forest is. What makes that balance important? And and sometimes it can be very difficult, I can imagine. How does that work? Well, you know, Kevin, you were a student athlete. You, you know how hard it is to balance those two. I'm not the test case. I should not be the <laughs> test case for this question. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I'll have to look back at your I you know you did well athletic. I'm sure you did well academically too. So we can we can look back in the in the records and dust off the dust off the records and find out. Uh, but no, I think I think it does I think it does take a, a certain type of student athlete that wants to come to a place like this. This is you know, this is obviously a high level division one power five athletic. I mean, it is the top of the top, right? For, you know, for all of our athletic teams. And yet along with that, you're going to get the rigors and the demands of a top notch academic institution, you know, where there's no shortcuts, mm -hmm. there's no easy majors, you know, there's no shadow departments. Um, you know, you got to do the work, right? And our, our student athletes know that or they find that out pretty quickly if they don't know that. Um, but I think a lot of credit goes to our coaches too, because our coaches obviously understand that and the coaches have to recruit the right student athletes, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they have to recruit, obviously not just on their athletic abilities. They have to know that these young folks are capable academically uh, of the rigors of this institution, you know, where, uh, there's a high level of accountability academically. Like you can't miss classes and you can't not do assignments. And you, you know, when you're in smaller classes, that's going to, that's going to stand out. Right. So, um, you know, I think, I think it does take the right student athlete coming here and, and either knowing it before they get here or finding out pretty quickly that the academic stuff is no joke. Like we don't play around here with that. And obviously I guess, you know, look back over time, there's probably been some that, found that out the hard way and aren't didn't make it didn't make it long here uh but those that either knew it coming in or figure it out uh I, I think they leave here obviously with the the best of both worlds they get that you know top-notch student athlete experience and and yet they graduate with a very meaningful degree right a degree they know they worked hard for you know how you hard you worked for your degree here and every student athlete that graduates from here realizes that when they finish what are some tools, some resources that, that Wake has invested in to make sure that we continue to stay on top of things, create that balance of the rigorous academics as well as excellence in athletics? What are some things in place that you've seen and, and continue to help build on to help ensure that Wake can keep that balance? Well, it starts at the top, right? I mean, it starts with the president at the university that understands the, the challenges of a high level academic program, you know, at, a, at an institution like Wake uh, with, the, with the athletic rigors that, that we have and the programs that we have. And, you know, I, I was appointed by President Hatch and obviously he very much understood that, was very supportive of that. And no doubt that President Wendy is following, following suit. I mean, she comes from a really high level academic institution at Vanderbilt and she mm -hmm. understands, you know, what, what it's like at this 
power five level. And so, you know, clearly it starts at the top, right? That there's going to be excellence in, in, in both areas that we won't accept anything but excellence in athletics and excellence in, in academics. And then, you know, that goes on down then to your athletic directors. And I had the pleasure of working with Ron Wellman for the first three, three years or so that I was in this role. And then I've had the pleasure of working with John Curry the last couple of years. And they set the tone, right, for the, at least on the athletic side of, hey, you know, of course we want to do well. We want to win championships. We want to do all those things, but not at the expense of, you know, cutting corners on the academics and bringing in student athletes that aren't going to make it here and aren't going to thrive here. And then that message obviously gets to the coaches and the coaches then are the ones that really, you know, I think have to bring in the right kids and continue to, to provide the right messaging, you know, about the academics. And then of course we have an amazing group of individuals that, that run our student athlete uh, support services, right? So many great uh, counselors and, and folks that, you know, help, help keep these, these, these young men and women all on track academically. Uh, so they're in the trenches doing it, you know, doing the work day by day. And, you know, as many student athletes as I've talked to, or there's, you know, they are very quick to, to thank uh, their student athlete support folks. And, and they realize what an important role they play in helping them, you know, uh, pursue their academic goals and, uh, and achieve them. Uh, so it, it's all the way down through the system, but it's got to start at the top and it's got to permeate mm -hmm. down. And then I think you have to just have a long history and culture of that. You know, I'm, probably for some schools, it's hard to change the culture. You know, if it hasn't been that way there, mm -hmm. um, then it's hard, you know, it's hard to change. But I think we're all very fortunate at Wake Forest that this has been, you know, the culture throughout the history of this great place uh, that, our, that our student athletes are first and foremost students. You know, that is, mm -hmm. that really, you know, that, that there's a reason why student precedes athlete. Right. And I think at, at Wake Forest, we always have always remembered that and haven't lost sight of that. And you're right. It has been a part of Wake's culture from the beginning. I remember when I was being recruited with Coach Caldwell, that was that was the understanding. And it wasn't just from the coaching staff with Caldwell. It was even from my high school coach. Mm -hmm. You know, he was prepping me saying, hey, if this is a place that you're interested in going this is what you need to understand that's going to happen. You have to focus on your academics mm -hmm. uh, as much, if not more than athletics to create that balance. And I, and I actually enjoyed that. And I felt that was a wonderful experience. And so uh, I also want to say you're, you are the first faculty member to be a guest on Deke to Deke. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to make sure that, uh, you had an opportunity to talk about that balance because it's important and also it should be a part of the student athlete experience uh, during, during that time. So I want to jump into something. Uh, back in December, it was the uh, graduation success rate was released for Wake Forest. So when you look at your role and you see graduation rates, 95, 96% for Wake Forest student athletes. How does that make you feel in terms of accomplishing the goal of having that balance? And I'm gonna be a little biased when you see the, <laughs> when you see the football team uh, winning 11 games, playing in the ACC championship, playing in the Gator Bowl, and then at the same time posting, you know, record numbers in terms of their graduation success rate how, how does that make you feel? I am proud as proud as can be, man. I mean, really, really, I am truly. And I guess it's worth mentioning too. I do have a graduate degree from Wake Forest. So I do have a little bit of deke in me. I have one child, one of my three kids went to Wake Forest, graduated from here, uh, was a student athlete here as well. She was on the track and cross country teams. So I've seen it as a, as a parent, I've lived it as a student, seen it as a parent. And now five years as this faculty rep, I've been up and up close and personal to, to these, you know, to these, you know, astounding metrics that you're talking about related to academics, whether it's the graduation rates, whether it's the GPAs, the, uh, all the GSRs, all these a APRs, all these metrics that are measured about academic success at an institution. And it's nothing, I'm nothing but just proud, you know, by, by this, my own, my own school, my alma mater, school of one of my kids, um, a school that I've been at for 30 years, to see how successful we can be in the athletic 
arenas and space and still, you know, reach these high top notch, you know, academic benchmarks. I mean, we are the envy of, of a lot of places. I, I can tell you that. And, you know, when I'm around my, my peers at the ACC conference, you know, far as faculty reps from other, other institutions, I'm like the, the proudest person in the room, right? Because I got the, I got the top and the best of both. You know, there's some schools that maybe, you know, have some higher athletic accomplishments, not many, but, you know, occasionally there's some sports that teams that do, but, you know, we're right there with them. And then yet here we are, you know, with these academic accomplishments that, you know, few, if any, in the conference really can match. And so um, that, that, you know, that was one of the reasons when I sort of accepted this role, I knew that we had this healthy balance. I've been here. I've been here for a long time. And, uh, you know, my own children, my own child go to school here. I, I know, you know, how well balanced this institution is. And so that helped me to make this decision to go into this role because I wouldn't want to be in this role if things were out of balance. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I thought that, you know, academically like this, you know, that there were problems. I guess I could say, well, I would try to fix that, but I don't, you know, back to our comment about culture and, you know, can you really fix that? Can you really change mm -hmm. the culture? Can one person change the culture in this role? Um, but I knew it wasn't a problem. And that's, you know, that is one of the reasons why I, you know, gladly stepped into it and, and feel really great about it. I feel like we're, you know, we're not at, at risk for uh, having this, this balance that, you know, out, out, of, out of place. And, um, and, and I don't think it's, you know, been that difficult to maintain that, you know, I mean, it's, um, I feel really good about both sides of that equation and, you know, the, the, the high level athletic achievements are certainly capable here. You can sell that to any, any athlete, but you can also with, with a very clear conscious, uh, you know, talk about the academic integrity, the quality education and all the experiences they're going to get here as a student, uh, independent of their athletic endeavors and 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 feel good about it and that's one of the things as an alum that i have also witnessed as being as i moved around professionally to have a degree from a university that everyone respects mm -hmm. that it was not just looking at me athletically but to have that respect for what i've accomplished academically as well and so you mentioned how long you've been at wake forest you came in 1991 if i'm not mistaken uh kind of let deacon nation know what kind of give you a background before that let's start from the beginning uh where you're originally from uh so long ago i almost can't remember kevin so, so far back but, uh no i'm from long island new york uh west, okay. west Hampton, long island new york and was very involved in athletics and Thought I was going to be a big time college football player. Um, that didn't exactly pan out. Um, and in high school, I really didn't apply myself academically much at all. I was so much into the athletics and thought I was, I was it, you know, and that was going to take me wherever I need to go. Uh, realized that wasn't the case and got lightly recruited and actually chose not to play uh, football or any athletics in, in college. Uh, ended up going to a D2 school thinking, still thinking I was going to play football there, but uh, something in my senior year in high school clicked and I said, you know, I, I better really start thinking about the academic side of this and put some more into it. And the more I did that, the kind of positive returns I got on that and uh, allowed me to, you know, kind of ease away from the athletic side. So I didn't even, I didn't even play athletics, any athletic in, uh, sports in college. What position uh, did you play in high school? I was a line, linebacker. And I knew back. it. I knew it. I, <laughs> I, I knew it. A fisherman knows a fisherman from afar. Yeah. And whenever I was, you just had this, this look. So Deacon Nation, you, you, I know you've seen Dr. Brubaker on the sideline interacting with the team. And when I say enter like on the sideline, he's not moving at all. Like I see that linebacker coming out of you from time to time on that sideline. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you yeah, decide, that mentality, that mentality probably won't serve me well as a 60 year old man, in, in young man's <laughs> game but uh I, I try to stay away from that hopefully i'm smart enough to realize i can't <laughs> do those things and get out of the way when i when i should um but so anyway the, you know i decided to focus on academics and and found what really is my my, my passion which is exercise science exercise physiology I, I i went to college thinking i would probably be a coach or an athletic trainer uh but then when i you know sort of discovered more of the science end of this more of the physiology and that really became um my, my interest. And I think like so many of us, it doesn't take, but, you know, one conversation with one individual in your life to, to sort of change your, 
your course. And that happened to me it was my junior year in college as I was finishing, you know, getting ready to start my senior year. Talked to one professor who I didn't even really know that well. I mean, they weren't particularly close, but at one one day, I don't know if he asked me or I asked him, you know, what do people do with an undergraduate degree in exercise science? Like, where, where is this taking me? Like, what am I going to do with this? You know, I'm talking 1984. Okay. This conversation so a while back right yeah and he said well you know he said there's different jobs and careers and so on he said but you know a lot of people go to graduate school for this and i was like graduate school hmm. i hadn't thought about that before like that was just like a little light bulb was like graduate school okay and then here's the better, best part of the story and kind of where history goes from there I said, well, where do people go for these? And he, he rattled off a couple of schools. And he said, we're starting a program here when I was at East Stroudsburg University in Pennsylvania. He said, but my close friend has just started a program, a graduate program at Wake Forest University. And I said, where's that? <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Long Island, New York. I'm yep. kind of a school undergrad in Pennsylvania. You know, this is the early 80s. Wake was a little more of a regional school, not maybe had the national exposure that it you know that it does mm -hmm. now and so he said north carolina i was like well i'll check it out and so a few months later i came down to visit and i was like this is it this is where i want to go to graduate school and i had said no to some of our our acc brethren down the road the light blue place you know and oh if you turn them down you can mention their names i <laughs> encourage you to mention the names if you've turned them down <laughs> yeah so i did i turned down a few others and came came to wake forest and um, i spent two great years here i just had you know tremendous experience with my with my faculty colleague mentors you know here um and then i then i had a great opportunity uh, for a job at, at duke and i left i left wake after with a master's degree and worked at duke for a year and that was really a great, you know, experience being at Duke and working in high level cardiology research, clinical research. But I'll tell you, Duke's a very different place. And coming from Wake to Duke, it was an eye, it was an eye opening experience. I and mean, it's really, you know, really different. I tell this to a lot of uh, prospective student athletes here when they're telling me that they're taking recruiting trips to Duke and Wake and, mm -hmm. and it, it's just really different. Uh, the, you know, the close knit feeling that I had as a grad student here and the relationships I built even at a year at, at Duke I, I never felt that way I yeah. never felt that there was many people that really cared about me the way people care at, at Wake you know I just did never had that feeling it was very competitive very very cutthroat you know like I'm I'm gonna get ahead of you no matter what I have to do I mean that's what you have to do to be a top five or whatever you, you know mm -hmm. institution there are versus being a top 25 or 30 like where maybe it's you know it's a different, it's, it's, it's a different way of, of operating, but I only spent a year there and uh, knew that at that point I needed to get my PhD. I wanted to get my PhD because I wanted to be at an institution where I could do, I could teach and do research. And, you know, I was not foolish enough to think I'd have an opportunity at Wake, you know, I mean, that would certainly have been a dream back then, but, you know, you don't know these things when you pursue degrees that are going to be four and five years out, but I knew I wanted, what I wanted to do was, was teaching and research and mentoring young young students and all that. So I ended up at Temple University in Philadelphia and talk about cultural shock. You know, <laughs> going from, going from, you know, going from these country club schools of Wake yeah. Forest and Duke and finding myself in North Philly. Yeah. You know, just like a fish yeah. out of water. I mean, like I had never been in an urban, you know, kind of environment like yeah. that. I was not ready for that whatsoever. But you know, it's one of those great things, you know, doing that and having that experience to draw on and you know I, i'm glad i did it you know it was painful in a lot of ways it's hard i had my car stolen twice uh you know i got assaulted in the city almost every day by somebody yelling you know it was, it was hard man hard it was hard to live and, and yeah. go to school in the city for four years so fortunately when i was finishing i had um, had my contacts here at wake and also at duke and had opportunities offers to go back to you know, either place. And uh, it was a no brainer. It was a no brainer to come back to Wake. I mean, it was a different, very different job. Again, it was that opportunity to be, you know, with young students and teaching and doing research. Duke would have been exclusively a research position, like it wouldn't mm -hmm. have been involved in undergraduate teaching and things like that. So I knew what I wanted. And, um, but even knowing what the, you know, the environment, the culture is like, you know, it was, a, it was a no brainer to come 
come back to Wake, and um, you know, it's just been great ever since 1991. So, Doctor Brewbreaker, you talked about your kids coming to Wake, and so you've seen Wake Forest from many different angles, almost every angle that you can see a university as a you you've uh, been a student uh faculty member now you, you've had children come through what is it about wake forest that is so attractive you mentioned the family aspect and and i did uh just some little bit of research to find out that the student to faculty ratio is now 11 to 1 yeah. it used to be as high as 12 to 1 can you believe that so uh what is it about Wake Forest? Relationships, relationships. I think the people that come to Wake, whether they're students or faculty or staff or whoever comes here and stays here, thrives, you know, thrives here. Not everybody does, but most people that come here like it and thrive. But I think those that, that stay and thrive um, and really value it are those that value relationships, you know, mm -hmm. that are, want to build those relationships, whether it's with your colleagues or with your students or, you know, whoever it may be that you're, that you're interacting with. But I think that's what makes this place, you know, very special and very different. And, and that, and like, you know, we were saying earlier, the, the family feel, the close knit, caring attitude that mm -hmm. the majority of people have here. I think that, you know, permeates from the top, you know, down. And I think our students feel that I, our students, I think really, uh, value the relationships they build with their faculty with the professors they have they they all seem to appreciate that the professors want to get to know them you know besides just being a student in the class but you know want to know them as as people and and be part of their life while they're here and beyond you know i mean i think most of the faculty really cherish the kind of relationships we were able to build with our students here because of the smaller numbers the smaller classes and and all that and then but then to carry that forward you know, to be able to, you know, stay in touch with these students and be part of their lives, not just for the four years that they're here, but, you know, for the next 20, 30, you know, 40 years after that. Uh, I think those are the people that really, really um, thrive and really, really enjoy Wake Forest. And it's that, it's that appreciation and the realization of the importance when it's all said and done, doesn't matter, you know, how many articles you publish or how many grants you get. In the end, it's, it's those relationships that you've built. Uh, they really are the most meaningful. So people that get that and uh, want that, those are the people that that really thrive, thrive at Wake. And I'll tell you, like, just as a parent, as a parent, um, my my oldest went off to uh, to school at NC State. Um, you know, I knew he was going to a very different place than mm -hmm. what I worked at, and and but it, that was right for him. You know, he felt comfortable going to that bigger school. We had a we had a funny conversation we're walking around and I said to him I said well this is a really big school you know and you're you've been you grew up around Wake and you see how I you know interact with you know my students and what I said it's not you're not really going to be like that here this is a you know, this is a big pond I said to him I said this is a, a big pond you know and are you going to be okay in a big pond you know maybe you know you want to be you want to be that big fish in a small pond are you okay being a small fish in a big pond and he's, he's an athletic kid and competitive kid he said don't worry dad I'm gonna be a big fishing no matter what size the pond is uh oh that's the linebacker there it is and i said all right well that's all right i said if you feel that way that's great you know so he went to nc state and you know he had a great experience there but he you know had very large classes obviously and mm -hmm. and when i would tell him like you're struggling in you know this class go talk to the professor he said you don't get it he said you can't get to the professors you can't talk to them they don't you know they don't have time for us they're and i was like you're right i don't get that I don't understand yeah. that because my door is open. Students are welcome anytime. Yeah. I know my students. And, but then, I, you know, I had to reflect about my colleagues at that institution go, well, they have classes. They have 300 students in a class. Like how close can you get, right, to mm -hmm. 300 students? And I'll, I'll be honest, one of the har hardest days as a parent when my son was graduating and needed to get some letters of recommendation, mm -hmm. you know, for jobs, he, he didn't really have a relationship with any professor well enough that he felt comfortable asking for a letter of recommendation. And I think that I thought about how many letters I write for my students and how well I know them and what I could put in those letters um, versus what, you know, what the situation was like for him at NC State. It was really, that was really hard for me. I felt like he got cheated, you know, yeah. out of something, right? That, that um, fortunately my next child, my daughter, 
came to Wake as a student athlete and she got all that, you know, and, but I, I always felt bad that uh, my son never had those relationships with professors the way I've been able to have those with my students. And then what I've seen my daughter and the relationships she, you know, built and created here uh, and how different of experience that was uh, for her versus, versus for him. And uh, Deacon Nation, you can come to football games, basketball games, and you're going to see Dr. Brubaker on the sideline, close to the team, cheering hard. And that's also a part of that relationship building is being involved in the lives of student athletes, students beyond just the grades or, and, and really having that strong relationship. I, I remember seeing you at games and, and seeing you get excited as well as, you know, maybe the game didn't go well, but still being that source of, of positive uh, inspiration. And so you've been very critical in building that. And that helps us when it comes to recruiting. Not many places can say they have professors that are cheering on the sideline and have these relationships where players are high-fiving. Uh, that's different, and but it's special also. Uh, but I also wanted to talk to you. Uh, I want to shift gears a bit about your work as a faculty member, as a professor, as the chair of health and sports science. Health and exercise science. Right, exactly. Sorry. Back in your uh, day, we at one point changed the name. It was sports science at one time, but we've in more recent years changed it to exercise science. Th thanks for reminding me of how old I am. When they <laughs> change the name of things, that's that's a that's a sign of it. Uh, you come in. You came in 1991, and if you fast forward to now, tell me two of the biggest shifts that you've seen in Wake Forest and its relationship with its students and student athletes? Wow, that's a really good question. And I don't, um, you know, having a really clear, not sure I have really clear examples of that because, you know, Wake Forest has grown in many ways, right? We've got more students than we did when I came um, mm -hmm. or everything we do, I think is, is much more national prominence than it, than it was in the eighties and nineties. And, you know, so to, to those looking from the outside, you know, we've, we've changed and grown a lot, right? I mean, it's a bigger school, athletic program is top notch. We, of course, continue to have, me, you know, medical school, law, business, all those great things that, you know, large universities have. And yet for those of us that are internal, you know, to all that growth and sort of national exposure, it doesn't feel like it's changed that much, you know, and I think... I think I've heard, you know, there's some alumni, right, that were around when, you know, we were 3,500 or 4,000 undergrads, you know, not that many years ago, and we're worried, you know, like, oh, this place is going to change, it's getting too big, it's going to lose its close-knit, you know, uh, personal attention and all the things that made it, made it great, and I feel like, you know, from the inside, it hasn't changed, right, it's mostly the the exposure and the recognition from the outside, you know, that's changed, you know, more than anything. So I don't know that I can really, you know, speak to sort of, sort of internally what I, what I think has changed. Um, I just think that the, the fact that we've been able to continue to compete at the highest level, right, despite the, you know, the massive amounts of money that are going into athletics and you know, at every, every place and that, you know, we've been able to match that you know with a small alumni base and mm -hmm. these kinds of things that that are challenging and limiting for us um you know i think despite that the fact that we've been able to do that and retain our our academic integrity you know not have given in to the other side of that where you know these athletes aren't students anymore mm -hmm. you know they're they're just taking online classes and you know, getting, taking these, the easiest majors they can find. Uh, but the reality here, that's not happened. You know, there's, there is no easy path. And so to see our, our athletic prominence and success continue to rise as the tide rises, but to keep, to keep our academic integrity and the quality of the experience and, and the academic rigor, uh, I think that's, to me, the most impressive thing. It's one thing to keep up yeah. with the you know, the arms race and the athletic side, right? But with that, you would think there'd be this sacrifice perhaps on 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 the other side, on the academic side. And I I 
that has not happened. I, I've had some conversations with uh, prospective student athletes or their parents or, you know, friends of mine that have kids that are interested in, in going to Wake. And I always share with them the number of, you know, the 11 to 1 student to uh, faculty ratio and how even though we've had an increased number of students to attend I think now it's maybe is it 5,000 total we have actually worked to maintain that ratio and and that is really important when you're talking about building a relationship but also being able to uh, gain insight in whatever it is you're studying because right. it is a smaller number you can spend that time with your professor and what that does for a student athlete when they're done and the impact of it. I, I've really enjoyed sharing that. And I've seen parents and prospective student athletes, I've seen their their eyes light up because they know they're going to get the best of both worlds in their in their total experience. So I want to talk. I'll about give you an example. I'll give you an example of that okay. happened just recently. My department, health and exercise science, is becoming is a very popular major on campus. And yeah large and, and growing um, number of number of students which is which is terrific but it starts to put pressure on your on your course sizes right and we've always had a goal in our in our major of trying to keep our class sizes around 20 to 25 like that is our target number now sometimes you have to let a couple kids in because you know their schedules and whatnot but that's sort of always been our target number well with the enrollment growth that we've had last year or so all of a sudden we're starting to see those sections, those you know, multiple sections of the same course start to grow or feel the pressure of maybe having to push it up from 25 to 30 or, or something. So I had a conversation with our dean last just this past spring and said, listen, here's the reality. I mean, we got these number of classes and these sections and we're starting to push, you know, beyond the twenties and starting to get into the thirties, you know, to accommodate our, our students, our majors. And her comment was very clearly, we don't do that at Wake Forest. She said, you tell me how many more sections you need of those courses and how many more faculty you need to teach those classes. We are not going to go up in our enrollment. We are not going to add students to classes. We will add more sections so we can accommodate more students, but we are not going to sacrifice that, that you know, small class you know, atmosphere. Because and, and, um, you're right, that is so critical to, to the experience that our students get students and student athletes get uh that that smaller class size you know being in the 20s is so different i've taught i've taught classes here in the 20s and at one point taught some classes that were in the 40s and, and that is so different it is like night and day teaching a class of 20 25 versus teaching a class of 30 and 30 in terms of how much time you can spend getting to know each student and the way you interact with them during class the dynamic of the class itself and the, and the time in class is dramatically different the dynamic and the type of interaction and engagement you can have in a in a smaller class with larger class. and then not to mention the out the outside opportunities you know the open door come to my office all those things uh that that's gets harder to do as that as that class gets bigger uh and then you know experiences beyond the classroom so that's the other thing that wake forest to really try to include our undergraduate students in our research you know research here is not just for graduate students i mean it's Sort of a bigger part of the graduate student experience, but we also want to make research a big part of the undergraduate experience too, and not just in the sciences, you know, but across across the board and all of the academic areas. And so we work, you know, faculty work very hard uh, to try to create experiences and opportunities for our students outside of the classroom, and that just gets harder to do when you go from twenty to thirty to forty, you know, of students that you have in class. So really blessed to work at a class at a university where class sizes are kept small and the administration you know top administration says no we're not going to we're not going to grow that way we'll add classes we'll add professors we'll add what we got to do to maintain that you know small class atmosphere because i think you're right that makes such a big difference in terms of the relationships that students build and can build with these professors I, I totally agree. And just speaking from my own experience coming in the mid 90s and, and finishing in, in May of 2000, because of my relationship with uh, professors, I was able to get recommendation letters. And I actually had my first job offer two months before graduation. Mm -hmm. But it was because of those relationships and, and that experience. Right. Uh, and I want to uh, let me add one, I'll add one thing to that, Kevin, too. I think, not to, to shift the conversation back, but I think 
faculty, because we're at a smaller school, because they know the students, they know what student athletes are going through. You know, yeah. they, they see it, yeah. they feel it. They know what they know what they have to do, right? At a big school, big class, you don't know. You don't know, yeah. right? Because I think the faculty here, for the most part, with a few exceptions, really appreciate and to some degree understand what a student athlete has to go through to be a student, to be an athlete at a Division One school, and what the commitments mm -hmm. are. I, I think the faculty here get that, and and therefore are more supportive and encouraging. And, and 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 um, you know involved with our student athletes. I have very few experiences I've heard of a of a faculty member here that treat the student athlete negatively, right? Yeah. We, uh, in fact, the most most I hear about is the opposite. And they really go out of their way to help and support because yeah. they they can appreciate and, and and know what what these student athletes have to do here, yep. and, and will go out of their way to support them. And, and so that's really important too. You know, it, it is. And but that un, here's what I learned as a student athlete is that understanding does not mean a reduction in expectation. No, no. And no. I remember. No. Uh, well, I remember, yeah, we're going to help you get there. Right. We're, you're going to yeah. still get there. We're going to help you, you know, yeah. but you're going to get there. That bar is still up there. You're just going to yeah. have some help getting there. And I remember uh, when we had uh, qualified to go to the bowl game, to go to the Aloha Bowl. And I had a Spanish assignment due on that Monday morning. And I remember my professor, I, I, I can't remember her name, but I spoke to her about it, said, hey, we've got this big game coming up. And she said, oh yeah, I'm gonna be there. And I said, well, what about this Spanish assignment? Oh, it's still due Monday at 8 a.m., but I'm gonna be there at the game supporting you. And I'll be available the rest of the weekend if you have any questions. So <laughs> she was not going, she understood it, right. but the expectation right. was still there. And I appreciated yeah. that. Yeah. And I hear so many coaches that I've talked to and, and the pride that they have when they see student athletes after a game, before a game, on a road trip, still getting assignments done. It, it's just a great experience overall. Uh, but I wanna talk a, a bit about your role with the, as sort of a liaison with the ACC and the NCAA, you and I talked a little bit about just the, the impact that you have in terms of uh, voting on legislation, policy, and governance. Sort of talk about that role a little bit. And when you see new policy come forth, how, how do you get the information and support to, to, to cast a ballot on some, some new changes of policy? Yeah, great question. I mean, it's uh, something we do we do regularly. Obviously, a lot of changes afoot right now with the NCAA and modernization proposals are coming quicker and more frequent than the normal cycle and constitution changes. So it takes team team effort. You know, we work very closely, obviously, with the folks in athletics. You know, especially the compliance folks. Um, you know, they they often have to sort of explain to me what does this rule change this proposal change mean to our student athletes and our coaches and so on and a lot of those proposals are very sport specific you know and i don't maybe understand the nuances of recruiting and you know some of the rules around that so i have to you know i have to lean on those folks to help me understand that and they of course have to lean on the coaches you know right so typically what happens when these proposals come along they'll come to me and Darren Cadell in our compliance office and and he will have the conversations with coaches first like about well, what do you think is this something you would support or not or and so that conversation goes on and then it then from there it comes to me and to and to Lindsay Babcock and, and John Curry you know sort of the, the academic administration to sort of say well what what do they think about that right i mean maybe a coach wants this change but maybe that doesn't work well for the you know on the administration side and, and so that a lot of that is you know kind of them for them to figure out because mm -hmm. I, you know in terms of some of these rule changes and things i you know i don't have a lot of skin in the game of some of that you know unless it affects student athlete well-being or their mm -hmm. academic experience i'm like hey this is this is in europe you, you know you tell me what's what's going to work best for your coaches and for you as administrators and all that. And of course we have, we also then have vetting of that, of all that through president Wendy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, commonly Lindsay 
And John and I will sit down with President Wente and say, well, here's the proposals that we've been asked to decide on. Athletics, you know, is in favor of this for these reasons or opposed to it. And we make sure that, you know, whatever decision they've come to, and I've sort of vetted from an academic side that she also vets, you know, from a, from a university perspective that this makes sense for, for us. And then, though, you know, depending on the, 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 the proposal and whatnot, it may be vetted through the ACC. Sometimes there's ACC sort of vetted proposals that then go on to the NCAA mm -hmm. or sometimes they go straight to the NCAA. So there's also in and around that as we come to our position on any given proposal, we're also engaging with our colleagues at our other ACC schools to see where we all stand, right? Because we don't really want to, you know, have a, have a big uh, contentious difference between the ACC mm -hmm. schools. We like to be united on, on these proposals as a conference, you know, at the to vote at the NCAA level. Um, so we have we have you know webinars and meetings and such to, you know, come to some kind of agreement and consensus about well, why does a certain school think that proposal should be supported or rejected and listen to them and maybe, you know, maybe that maybe for their perspective it's it has a different different feel than from our perspective and so. Uh, we try to we try to collaborate and communicate with with our pre peer institutions and and then you know ultimately make the final decision and um, you know but that's in collaboration with a with a lot of a lot of different folks. Now, over the past four or five years, we've seen a lot of major changes when it comes to the conference and the NCAA examples, the uh, name, image, and likeness, the the transfer portal, all of those things surrounding those. What are one or two emerging issues that you see coming down the pipe over the next year or two that Deacon Nation should sort of be aware of from the NCAA or from the ACC? Well, you know, we just voted on a new constitution for the NCAA. Okay. And that um, that's about a 13, 14 page document, which sort of gives the overarching principles and priorities of the NCAA. And a big part of that is a, is a much clearer delineation and separation of the divisions and giving each division one, two, and three a lot more of their own autonomy to make, make their decisions. And some would say it's the, it's the beginning of the end as the NCAA as we know it, in that, that division one is sort of veering off on, onto its own, mm. right? and separating out from the other divisions. And there was quite a, a spirited discussion yesterday as this vote was taking place <laughs> the Constitution yeah. about the division two and three folks not, not being entirely thrilled with this new constitution, but that's the reality of it is it's, you know, clearly there's, there's gonna be this opportunity for, for D1 to really make more of its own decisions and not worry so much about the impact it may have on D2 and D3. So that's gonna change the landscape um, and, you know, so that's, that's a, that's a big change. And then with, and then within, within, uh, D1, there's, there's widespread belief that conferences are going to have a lot more autonomy as well. And that as, as the NCAA is sort of decentralized, then the conferences, you know, play a bigger role in, in deciding what, what's right for them and what do they want to do as a conference. And, you know, whether that means that, you know, conferences, uh, you know, have different rules and those things, that's, that's certainly, you know, that's certainly possible. Now, the real work of all that begins now that there's a new constitution, because there's a group of individuals that have been assigned to work on what's called the transformational committee. And so what that is now that we have this new constitution and a little clearer just differentiation between the divisions, now there's people that are working to really dig into the, into the rule changes. And so instead of rewriting a 13 or 14 page document, rewriting a three or 400 page document uh, is what's on tap now. Wow. Uh, and that is to be done by summer of this year. So this transformational committee is essentially rewriting the rules of the NCAA manual as we know it uh, and expecting to complete that work by, by this summer. And so that, that that's going to be a big challenge because there's a lot of a lot of detail in there uh, that has to be worked through. But that's that's what's happening next. And um, so I think you know we're seeing the the landscape really really change. And 
not sure what it's all going to look like on, on the other side. Do you feel that Wake, with our leadership and the direction that we're going, that we're really prepared to deal with some of these changes and emerging issues that you're talking about with the change in the Constitution and this trans transformative committee? Is Wake in a great place to deal with potential change that may come down the pipe? From a yeah, I, I, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I think we are in part. You know, the the new Constitution clearly, you know, defines the importance of of the academic part of this equation, right? And so it's sort of doubling down on these are student athletes, and that I think plays to our wheelhouse, right? That's that's mm -hmm. what we that's what we do. We, these Wake Forest uh, student athletes, as we've talked about most of this time. That's that's what they do. I think other schools are going to have a little more trouble with that, you know, that they maybe don't have that uh, kind of academic um, focus, uh, you know, first and foremost, and and retaining the 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 collegiate the, the collegiate athletic model, you know, is also is language that in this new constitution and and I, again, I think we are the you know we are the poster child for what is the collegiate athletic experience, you know, we. We, we have that and um, a lot of schools don't. So yeah, I, I think from that standpoint, Wake is ideally positioned and you know, we have tremendous leaders here, you know, from our president and our athletic director, athletic staff, uh, no question that whatever, however this thing evolves and where it goes, we're gonna be there. You know, we're gonna be there athletically and we're gonna be there academically. I don't have any question about, you know, about that. And I think Wake Forest, the Deacon Nation will, I think, will continue to be happy with, you know, who we are as this thing evolves. I don't, I think because of our culture, because of our history, that it's easy for us to, to retain, you know, that, that balance that we've been talking about today, that balance of the athletic and academic experience, um, even though this thing is going to change and, and evolve and look different, that, that core balance or, you know sort of expectation and culture about is going to stay there I'm, I'm convinced of that well doc i got this question that i ask all of our guests and i think you're going to have a really good response to this in your time at wake you've seen a lot of great things on the court off the court in the classroom tell me tell deacon nation two of your favorite deacon moments one on the playing field and then one off the playing field. Wow. Um, you know, there, there's so many, Kevin. I mean, the athletic, you know, I love seeing, you know, I love, I love getting to know our student athletes. I love seeing them be successful. Um, and, you know, sometimes I, what I've really enjoyed is seeing the success of, of maybe some of the, the lesser known sports, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, it, it's easy to be excited about football bowl wins and, basketball ACC championships and that you know I've seen a lot of those things here and you know those are you know incredibly fun and rewarding to see that and and all that but you know what I like being around the teams and, tra and traveling with them and what is to see some of the some of the athletes that you know are successful you know winning a mm -hmm. winning a meet or winning a match or or something and um, you know knowing they're doing it because they really truly love it and want to be playing and you know the just you can see how much hard work and effort and focus has gone into this and then to see this come so you know it's really hard because i've seen so many of those kind of moments you know that it's hard to kind yeah. of drill down to one you know because you just know that at this this to be successful at this level as an athlete uh, as someone who you know was an athlete that wasn't able to be you know at this level and and to see what goes into to that to to achieve success at this level um, you know, to see someone actually achieve that and know how much work they put into it and dedication and sacrifices, that to me is the most rewarding part of it. And so whether you see that on a track athlete or mm -hmm. tennis or a volleyball or something, uh, I can really, you know, I can really appreciate that and just admire those student athletes for, you know, for their, for their passion uh, about their sport and the way they're able to balance that with the rigors of, of the academics and and so forth. Um, and then, you know, on the academic side, it's anytime you see a student athlete go across that stage and get a degree, right? Um, and, and, you know, we all know examples of some that you weren't sure they're going to make it, 
you know, like they really struggled and just, yeah, maybe just made it through. But those are the most rewarding ones, right? To see uh, folks that maybe didn't, you know, didn't feel like they had a chance uh, to be here. And, 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 but yet somehow they're able to, they're able to do it and to see them walk across the stage and see them get the degree and see their families and, and to know that getting that degree changes the tra trajectory uh, of their life um, and, and their, their kids' lives and the, you know, the future of their, uh, of their family. So um, it, it's hard, it's really hard to put it, any of those, either the academic or the athletic in, in any one particular thing. Um, and I, just because there's been so many great moments and so many, you know, individual success stories, both athletically and academically, that it's, or that I'm just getting so old that it's all blurred, you know, 30, <laughs> year, 30 years of it, you know, all, all, all together. But, um, you know, that's why I enjoy this role so much because I can see, you know, I get to know the student athletes well enough and I know what they, what they're doing and how hard they're working both in both their academic and athletic endeavors. And then when I see them have success in both of those things, it's just, you know, just really uplifting and, you know, I just I just take so much pleasure from seeing seeing them have success. And now you talked about your role, uh, but I would also like to talk about uh, your role as faculty. And in 2017 or 18, you had a proposal that got funded. Am I correct? Well, yeah, well, yeah. Kind of yeah. talk about kind of well, talk about you know. that because I want Deacon Nation to know the uh, great faculty that we have working with our student athletes. Yeah, no, I've been very fortunate. You know, my my career here uh, again, Wake for me, Wake Forest was really ideal because I could I could be in the classroom and teaching students who really want it, but it also allows me to have great research um, mm -hmm. opportunity as well. And a lot of that because because we have a medical center, quite honestly. The kind of research I do is in you know, chronic disease conditions, particularly cardiovascular disease. My area is cardiovascular physiology. That's what I did my PhD in. It's, you know, still what I do now research-wise. So that was a big draw coming back here too. I knew that I had these collaborators and colleagues at the medical center, you know, that I, that I would work with on these research projects. And so I have a number of, of colleagues in cardiology. I mean, I basically work with, you know, with cardiologists. Uh, and so, you know, I've had a, a really nice long history of, of getting funding for research work. And of course, with that comes publications and books and more research grants and all those things. So yeah, I mean, I've been through the full process of working as we all do in academia from an assistant professor and, you know, getting, getting everything started with, with research and then building that and having success and, uh, you know, and then, and then promoted to associate professor and ultimately full professor. Um, and you know, along with that opportunity to travel the world and speak at conferences, you know, all over the world and meet people and have collaborators coming, you know, from other countries to spend time here, you know, to work with me. And so, yeah, I've had, you know, I've had a tremendous, uh, tremendously rewarding academic career here, in, you know, in the 30 years that I've, that I've been here. Um, and I haven't slowed any of that, you know, that hasn't stopped or slowed yeah. down, you know, just to put it in perspective, this, um, this role of the faculty athletic rep, it really is above and beyond everything else I do. I'm, I'm not, I don't really get any release or, or relief from anything else. I still teach the, you know, typical number of classes. I'm a department chair. I, mean, I have all the same, you know, academic uh, teaching and research expectations and commitments as, as anybody would. And so this is really a piece, a piece on top of that, that I was willing to take, take on. And now I do, I will say I get some, I do get some additional compensation for it, but it does, that doesn't provide me with, yeah. with any excuses to say to my colleagues here in my department, oh, sorry, I can't do that because I'm going to be, you know, traveling with this team or I'm going to the NCAA. Yeah. I, I never, you know, want to give uh, anyone in my department the appearance that I'm, I'm sacrificing anything on the on the academic side for this role so to me this is what i do at nights and weekends and you know those kinds of things and the timing was right you know because my kids had gotten to the point where they were all grown and either were in college or or beyond and and my wife was more than supportive of, for me to you know to be gone at nights to go 
come back over and watch a, you know, watch a game of something or to mm-hmm. travel with a team on the weekend and, and all those kinds of things. So uh, the time was right for this, that I could, you know, I would didn't have to sacrifice anything professionally. I didn't have to sacrifice anything personally uh, to do what I'm doing in this, in this role. I'm still able to give it as, as much as I can. Well, Dr. Brubaker, I really appreciate you. And on behalf of Deacon Nation, thank you for all you do to continue to make Wake Forest that student athlete experience, that student experience, a world-class experience. Uh, Again, you talked about the success of the various programs, not just our major ones, and how even in their success on the field, they still appreciate that off the field in the classroom experience. I had a chance to talk to Lauren Crandall with uh, Mm -hmm. play field hockey, LaChina Robinson, uh, just so many that have talked about what that meant to have that experience and to be able to come back to campus and spend as much time talking to coaches as you do with, with professors and appreciate you and all you've done to help to continue to, push the culture and and make sure that that is sustainable long term because it has continued to be uh, a major contributor to contributor as to why we get the quality student athletes that we do and have had the success that we have had and so I want to make sure I give you your flowers that <laughs> in, in what you've done I mean you talk in 30 years there are a lot of student athletes that have come through in 30 years and again, to have a, a graduation success rate of, I think it's 96.1. It is. It's astounding. It's astounding. It, it, really, it, is. it really is. And it's and everybody at this play, every other institution, you know, needs a pat, a back, pat, pat on the back for that, really. It does take, you know, it's a team effort, obviously. And, you know, we talked about various folks that have to play a role here. Um, but, you know, to have that kind of success, it's, it's got to be everyone buying into it, right, from the top. Yeah all the way down, everyone's buying into, you know, what's really important here and, and, uh, and living that, you know, not just talking it, but actually living it. And so I'm happy to just be a small little piece of that, you know, and, um, and I get, I get, I'll tell you what, Kevin, I get a lot more out of it than I give. Uh, I'll say that wow. I, I get a lot more back and enjoyment and personal benefit and joy than I way more than I give. That is awesome. Well, one last question that we ask, again, each guest, who would you like to see next on Deek to Deek as a guest? <laughs> Man, I don't know. I'd have to, I guess I'd have to look at, um, you know, who you've had. I haven't mm-hmm. actually. I need a name. I need a name. I need a name. You need a name. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you know, so I guess you like sort of alumni, I mean, versus, versus. Current. Doesn't matter could be current <laughs> oh i'm going to get a name <laughs> you're going to get a name here's a here's a name for you talk about um a good friend of yours my my good friend dr brandy peaker dr peaker yep was, was one of my favorite students of all time She's a classmate of yours and she was not an athlete here but she was very much involved in the athletic program as a as a as a as a deacon deacon darling or deacon something or other deacon diva something that she you know and, <laughs> yep. and is a really proud really a proud alumni um, you know of the school and continues to follow the athletic program and what it's doing she's always texting me about you know this <laughs> man or that man or so on but she's going on to do some really amazing things kevin i mean she's going on to medical school and become a doctor she worked at the center centers for disease control for a number yeah. of years uh, now she's in washington working for the uh, preventive health uh, department there and and I'll tell you what, not, nothing else. She's been busting her butt on this COVID thing too. And there's been a number of athletic events that she's wanted to attend, including recent bowl games that she couldn't because of the uh, because of, of COVID having to work in the COVID management system. She was going to come to the championship football game in Charlotte, uh-huh. got called in for service related to COVID. Um, so talk talk to her. She will give you a great, I think, perspective as an alum, right? Some of this yeah. alum. Oh yeah. That really. Um, you know, it was sort of part of the athletic program, knew a lot of you guys and all that, uh, but how, how she feels as a, as a proud alum as she works her way through her career, which is, you know, she's been in some pretty high level positions. 
And that, and that is all awesome. And that's what we look to push here and promote at Deek to Deek is every aspect of Wake Forest athletics. And it's not just players. It's not just coaches. There's so many people that play important roles like yourself and like Dr. Peeker that, uh, that really are a part of continuing the sustainability of success on the field and off the field. And, and we want to give people their flowers that have helped contribute to that. So I'll definitely uh, look at making sure we get Dr. Dr. Peeker on and, uh, right. and share and share her story. But Dr. Brubaker, any, any parting uh, advice or insight that you want to share with uh, Deacon Nation before you have no, to get out of here? I just want to thank you, Kevin. I, I mean, it's been a pleasure to get to know you here recently. I knew of you as a student athlete. You know, I didn't know you well personally, but to have, have you back here and doing what you're doing is so critical. And this this idea that you've had, you know, to do this deep to deep thing is great. And it's really, really important aspect of, of um, you know, our whole enterprise. And so thank you for the opportunity to, to be here and for you to do what you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You guys make it so easy. So easy. <laughs> Well,